Hi, so um, I thought I'd, because, yeah, you know what, we're just going to leave this in. I, I started over three times already because I stumble over my own words. So I'm just going to leave this in and just carry on. This is a VR. This video is a VR, as you can tell by the title, to the 25 serious questions. Um, I think it's the 25 serious questions or 25 deep questions. Um, but you know what, I started over three times because I got it wrong and I'm just going to run with it. Mine is going to be a VR to Heather Carter. I have not watched anyone's yet. I wanted to make sure that I recorded mine first and then, uh, so I can't wait to, uh, today I'm going to, you know, catch up and I'm going to start with Heather's and, and, um, anyone else who's done it because I, I find it very interesting. So I will have the 25 questions. Uh, I'm going to copy and paste them in the box below. You are welcome to just grab them and I'd love to see you, um, to love to see your video, your responses to these questions. And so let's begin because um, it's 25 questions and this could easily be an hour long. So I'm going to, I'm not going to, um, I'll, I'll try not to ramble. I can't promise. Um, but I'll try to be a little more succinct, a little more, you know. Anyways, you know what I mean. Less long-winded. Number one, are you leave? Are you leaving? <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. Number one, are you living a meaningful life? I certain I certainly strive to. I really, really, uh, I think about this a lot. Am I living a meaningful life? And for me, a meaningful life will be, a uh, meaningful life, the definition of that is that when I look, when I look upon, um, at the end of the day, when I look upon my day, that I feel like I've um, really um, used my time uh, to the best of my ability. A meaningful life for me is to not feel like um, I'm bored or wasting time or a meaningful life to me also means not just waiting for things to happen but to participate mindfully in whatever is going on in my life good or bad number two what's the one thing you cannot live without freedom this one for me it's um, freedom and I mean freedom in every sense of the word um, but also as mundane as I need to be physically free to um, move around um, so I need freedom from a, something as basic as mobility personal mobility of my body to um, a work environment that does not require I be trapped. Um, some of you, if you've been watching me for a while, you know I'm a healthcare professional. I've been one for three decades, um, at least. I've been a healthcare professional since the 80s. And yeah, that's probably four decades. But you know what I'm saying, like 30 something years. And I, um, at this stage in the game, at this stage in my career, at this stage uh, of my in my life of my life, I cannot be confined. There is no way I can. There's no way at this uh, this stage in my life I could tolerate being trapped, and that's how I feel trapped uh, on a hospital unit for a 12-hour shift. Um, when I was younger, earlier on in my career, I worked in the OR, and uh, I worked vascular surgery. So that was uh, eight hours minimum in the OR and I was fine but now when I now at, at this stage in my life there's no way I would tolerate that so when it comes to work environment I need to have um, work that engages my mind and I cannot live without freedom if there if I'm not free it kills me so there freedom is is one thing I cannot live without. I think I 
explain myself. Okay. When is it acceptable, if ever, to disobey the law? Um, personal defense. Self-defense. Um, either self-defense or um, uh, your like self-defense of yourself to defend someone else's life, to save someone else's life. I think that um, those are uh, situations where if you're saving, you know, if you are um, acting to save someone's life or self-preservation in terms of self-defense, um, I'm not saying it's acceptable to disobey the law at any time, but what I'm saying is that uh, I can understand that. And um, it's not that it's acceptable to disobey the law, but you have to make, you have to choose survival and, you know, knowing the consequences. I would choose survival, keeping the consequences in mind. What do you want your final words to be? Thank you, and I love you. I've had a wonderful and beautiful life. What inspires you most? Um, I'm inspired by the world around me. I'm inspired by nature. I am inspired by other people being inspired. I am inspired by art and beauty and, and music and poetry and literature. I am, I am inspired by the same things that inspire people who create art because at my core, I'm an artist. What do you think are the five most beautiful things in the world and why? Well, I think the five most beautiful things in the world, um, if, if I, you know, if I were to, a sunrise, a sunset, those could be a starry sky, the ocean, um, a newborn baby, is just um, I remember when my children were born that that sense of there's every you know of something so much greater than us um, mountains I live in the I live where there's mountains and um, when I drive to work um, which I'm so so blessed to be able to spend a lot of time driving for my job which I absolutely love um, the view between the mountains the lake the trees it's the five most beautiful things in the world um, is just though you know I think I said I think I mentioned more than five um, things that are abstract things that are not objects love um, is another beautiful thing in the world. Um, yeah, I probably should have made notes, but I think I captured. I just think the world is beautiful. Um, what makes you feel most empowered? I think what makes me feel most empowered is knowing from experience, from trial and error, that every day brings with it, every time the sun rises and you wake up in the morning, every day brings with it the opportunity to start over. And I find that, that knowledge and that experience, because I have experienced starting over many times, empowering. I've, the experience, the, the, act, the mere act of starting over is empowering. The mere act, and the flip side, the mere act of knowing that you can end, you, could, you can decide to end any situation that is causing you pain, that is causing you harm, I find that empowering. Because, think about it, um, if you're in a situation that is causing you harm, you can end it. 
And all you need to do is make that decision and you will feel empowered because the universe or whatever you, God or whatever you, or spirit or, or saints and angels and whatever you call it will all conspire to come to your aid. What is more important, what you say or how you say it? Neither. What you do. Actions speak louder than words. Res non verba. Actions, not words. So that to me is um, the most important. But if I had to choose with what you say or how you say it, well, both. What Mean what you say and say what you mean and say it. Um, say it, be kind. Especially when it's, um, when it's not positive. Like when giving feedback, when giving um, someone feedback, it's the way you say it too. Um, I know people, oh my gosh, a pet peeve of mine, just a quick tangent, is people who say, oh, I'm blunt. Okay, it's like, um, you know, sorry if I offend you, but I'm blunt. And it's like, no, that's just, you, 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 what you're doing is just being fucking rude. Um, you could be direct, but you can be kind at the same time. So there, there's my tangent. Always tell the truth, be humble, be kind. Do you believe in heaven and hell? Do I believe in heaven and hell, in heaven and hell as uh, locations in the afterlife? No. I believe in heaven and hell as a state of mind that we live in here on this earthly plane. I believe in, um, you can make your world heaven, you can make your world hell. You can be born in a situation that is heaven. You could be born in a situation that is hell. Some of it is in, some of it is in your control to change. Some of it is out of, con out of your control. But I don't believe in heaven or hell as, a lo as locations in the afterlife. Do you live to work or work to live? I like to say that um because live to work means that you know you live for your job and work to live means that well it's a job so that you can live pays your bills right i struggle with this because um i am a person who identifies with what i do a lot of people do a lot of people, their identity is wrapped up in what they do for a living. A lot of people, their, their identity is wrapped up in their profession. And my identity and my profession is so intertwined and gets really complicated because I also have this metaphysical aspect to my identity that um, doesn't always mesh with my professional identity. Um, for the most part, it does. Um, my practice is in uh, my nursing practice is a very holistic practice in terms of my philosophy, but my actual uh, occupation is not holistic in any shape or form. It's very um, not holistic. It's very medical. So. Do I work to live or live to work? For me, it's a little bit of, you know, um, if I could choose, um, I probably would rather work to live, you know, um, where I have a job that pays my bills, but my, all my 
of focus and attention can go to um, more creative outlets, which is where my heart is. But I'm so, it's, it's, it's like being in a very long marriage. I've been married to my profession for over 30 years. Um, we're set in our ways. We have our routines. We're complacent. <laughs> so I probably, um, I guess the answer to that is I probably still do uh, live to work because I, I, I still identify with my relationship with my profession even though my heart wishes I could just leave that at the door and then all my energy and, and inspiration and focus and creativity is directed towards more artistic outlets I hope that was probably so confusing I confused myself do you trust anyone with your life yes I trust one person with my life. Would you consider yourself an introvert or an extrovert? I am firmly an introvert. Absolutely firmly an introvert. As most people who are content creators in, in this kind of fashion, like on YouTube, are uh, introverts. Do you believe in true love? I absolutely do. How do you think the world will change in 10 years, 50, 100? Um, technology will change. Technology will advance. People, though, will remain the same. Uh, one of my favorite quotes, and I'm paraphrasing because I didn't prepare it, but I wanted to share it, is from Cicero. Cicero I think it's like 500 BC or something like that Cicero okay and he says ah basically paraphrasing the world is going to shit teenagers don't listen to their parents and everybody's writing a book and that to me always makes me laugh when I when I read the exact quote because people don't change the humanity doesn't change um, the human, the, you know, human nature doesn't change. Technology advances, but we are basically human. If you had the option to know the date and circumstance of your death, would you? Okay, so this, I'm going to try to express um, as, you know, as articulately as I can. I'm going to try to articulate this because this has to do with beliefs. And, and also, it's not just my personal beliefs, it's also my personal experience. One, my experience over the last three and a half decades of the environments I've worked and the people, my, and, personal, and pe personal experiences, people I love, people I know. Not one person that has passed away or that has died, that I had direct contact with, um, has ever said um, they didn't know. So let me, let me explain what I mean. Everyone I know in my life who is dead knew they were going to die before it happened. And they've shared it with me. My father would talk to me about, okay, you, you know, he would talk to me, start conversations with, when I die, this, 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 and that. And it's like, within five years, he was dead. He just knew. And that's just one example. Another example was, I mentioned in a previous, previous video, my cousin Marco. Um, I'm not going to search for it now, but it's still on my phone. The text that he sent me um the week before he died he died suddenly of a massive heart attack um a week before he died he texted me and he said hey do you think we know when we're gonna die it was something to along those lines and we had this conversation back and forth and i said why what do you say because i don't know i'm just kind of thinking about it i kind of feel like i i'm gonna die or 
It wasn't even that direct. I think it was because when he said, hey, do you think we know when we're going to die? And I thought we were just having, you know, a, a discussion um, on my experiences with other people. Um, but then when I looked back at the text, he knew he was going to die. So would I want to know the exact date and circumstance of my death? Not right now, because that means I'm going to die pretty quick. Um, but I do know that when the time comes, I will know. We all know. What is something you are certain you will never experience? Well, um, I'll never experience parenting a male child because I have only um, daughters. Um, I'll never experience, I don't know. That, that was the first thing that came to mind. I know I will never experience that. Now, if we talk about things I would never do, well, I would never experience a ride on a roller coaster. I have no interest in a ride on a roller coaster. Um, terrifies me. But I think, um, yeah. So that is something that I'm certain I will never experience is parenting a male child. Um, but the rest is all open-ended. I don't want to say never because I can't think of anything that I would never experience except for the roller coaster ride. Sorry, not happening. Um, I, yeah, that's, I guess that's it. What impression do you think you give when you first meet someone? I, I, I have, I have been told um, the impression I first, people have, have shared with me that their first impression of me was that I came across as um, mean. Or not mean, but I have resting bitch face and uh, I'm shy. So you couple resting bitch face with someone who is um, socially shy and uncomfortable, um, you have someone that comes across as and, and, to, to top all that off, um, in a professional setting, I, am, I have resting bitch face, I am shy when I first meet people, and I'm very uh, factual, very objective. So I come across, people have said that, I, um, that I'm far warmer once they get to know me than when they first met me. Their impression of me when, when they first met me is completely the opposite of how I am now that they know me. How would, you perf how would your perfect partner treat you? My perfect partner would treat me exactly the way I treat them. If I am good to someone, they need to be good to me. If I'm not good to someone, they need to let me know. They need to show me. It's a mirror. I think relationships, we mirror each other. And if my, you know, so my perfect partner would mirror to me uh, how I treat them. And I, would, and I know that I am treating them kindly and with love by what I get back. If I'm not getting the same thing back, and I know for certain that uh, I am being loving and I am being gentle and I am being uh, compassionate and kind and caring and, and you know, um, concerned for their welfare and that's not coming back, it's not reflecting back, that is not your perfect partner. But at the same time, if you're being a shit and your partner's being a shit, stop. Maybe if you stop being a shit, if the reflection you get back in your relationship from your partner does change just like you have, then you're in a good relationship. What one responsibility do you wish you did not have? Oh my God, I say this time and time again and it always goes back to um, work. Um, I hate I have hated 
any professional situation where I was responsible for other people's actions. That is a responsibility I absolutely do not want to have. I am glad to, I am res I'm glad and um, happy to be responsible for my own actions, but I do not. I refuse to um, take on responsibility for other people's actions. So that is why after uh, a few stints in management, I decided it wasn't for me. What is something you are embarrassed by because you are so good at it? Not so much that I'm embarrassed by this, um, but it goes back to the previous question. Um, I'm, I hate management. I hate being management. But I also hate the fact that I'm really good at it. So I always get sucked into, so it doesn't matter what situation, um, well, how my work situation starts out, um, somewhere along the line I always end up in a leadership role. And it happens really quick and it happens without me wanting it. And it's because I'm really, really good at, um, I'm a strong, I have strong leadership skills and um, I have excellent management skills and I freaking hate it. So um, I'm not embarrassed by it, but it hinders, it hinders me or it's, it's always come up as, as a dilemma where um, where I work will say, well, you need to, you know, no, no, this is, you know, you're being promoted and this is what you're going to be now. And I'm saying, no, no, I don't want that. I'm not good at it. And they say, no, you are. And I would say, no, but I don't want to. Yeah. So that that's an example right there. Another thing that um, I'm really good at is... Um, interacting with people socially in a work environment. So um, I'm very approachable and I'm very open and warm and make people feel at ease uh, on the worst day of their lives. Uh, usually like it, this is probably a skill that I honed working emergency, um, but it's exhausting. So it's not that I'm embarrassed by it, but it's, it's an acting job because I'm an introvert. So the sentiment is sincere. I sincerely care about people. Um, the actual execution of it, um, I find it um, exhausting because I'm an introvert and shy, but not in a work context. If it's not about me, I'm not shy. Uh, that made no sense. Anyway, how do you recharge? Oh my gosh. Well, how do I recharge? I recharge with solitude and silence. That's how I recharge. I love my solitude for recharging and I love silence. So while some people relax by having the TV on in the background or whatever, I... Um, how do I recharge? Um, driving in my car in silence, just looking at the beautiful view, mindful in the moment, just concentrating on driving. What's one thing you most want to achieve before you die? <sighs> I probably should have given that one thought. What would I, you know, one thing that I most want to achieve before I die? Um, for sure I'd like to write some more books. For sure I'd like to um, make more art. Um, before I die I think I want to um, shift my attention and my energy towards my creative output. What is something that offends you? Okay, um, two things offend me that right away. One, not that it offends me, but it's like it, the, second, the second someone lies to me, it's over. I, I'm a human lie detector and 
um, this is why it's two things. One, I'm a human lie detector, and people who know me know I'm a human lie detector. So when they choose to lie to my face, they insult my intelligence. So those are two things that offend me. Lying and insulting my intelligence. Um, just because I don't blast you verbally, don't mistake my kindness for weakness. So that is, those are things that, oh, but the lying, it's not that it, it enrages me, it's beyond offending. It, lying, people that lie to me, or lie to any, or someone who just blurts out a blatant lie and they think that we're buying it, it's like, no. Um, what, what part of your culture are you most and least proud of? Okay, these last two questions are a little political. The last one's political, but the number 24. What part of your culture are you most and least proud of? So I'm going to go with my culture of origin. Um, Italian culture. My parents uh, were Italian immigrants. And the part of my culture I'm most proud of is, it, you know, Italian culture is known for its art. It's known for its uh, history. Um, it's known for its aesthetics in terms of, you know, beautiful things. And again, going back to art and, um, and it's known for its food. Um, so that, when it comes to Italian culture, I'm most proud of history, art, food, um, yeah, and the, how diverse, because unless you are, um, if, if you're born, like, if, if you're like a few generations removed from the Italian immigrants in your family tree, you may not be aware that Italy itself, it's a small peninsula, is a republic. And it's made up of all these different regions that are distinct, diverse and distinct from one another. They even ha each have their own dialects. So um, Italy is not just a big blo homogenous blob. So, and I love that Italy, even after um, it was, Italy was, became a country, a republic, only in like the late 18, like, you know, around 1860 something. Um, so that's not that long ago in the big scheme of things, right? So, love the Italian culture, the Italian language. Um, most proud of that. The one thing that I'm least proud of Italian culture is its gangster, mobster culture, mafia culture, camorra culture, organized crime culture. That's, that's the part of my culture I'm the least proud of. But you know, especially but in the way pop culture makes it appear, you would think that it's you know, it, you know Italian culture is an eighty percent uh, organized crime culture, eighty percent mafia culture. Uh, there's also the you know the whole tacky, um, the ugly uh, Italian American Canadian Italian um, tacky side of that culture, where it's a caricature of itself. Um, that I'm the least proud of. I gotta say it. Um, oh yeah, and pop culture will have you believe, especially if you, if you live in North America, you grew up in North America, that, uh, Italian culture is all gumas, goombas, um, it's all pizza and chicken parm, it's all, um, really tacky and cafone. Um, when it's not, um, that's not, that, that's probably, um, what, what is seen the most because that is the most extroverted expression of Italian culture. Um, typically from, you, you know, found like it's the, the out, the outward expression of Italian American, Italian Canadian culture, um, that gets all the buzz, right? Television and all that stuff, movies, um, where, uh, like, you know, if you want to see, um, it's the difference between watching, say, Goodfellas, 
uh, and Big Night, which uh, is a movie with Stanley Tucci, uh, Antonio Banderas, and um, Isabella Rossellini. Big Night. So if you want to see the difference between, y you know, you see the, di or you can watch The Godfather, the mafia experience, um, and around this, you know, and then like 1950, early 1950s, immigrant experience in Big Night, um, Big Night is 80% of what it was like for Italian immigrant experience. And like I said, that whole cafone, tacky, pop culture, Italian American, Italian Canadian culture, that's, that's only, that's a very small percentage of what my culture is actually like. All right, last one, number 25. What makes you angry about your country? That's a political question. And I'm not going to answer it because I uh, keep my political views to myself. So that's it for me. Those are the 25 um, serious questions or deep questions. I forget what, it, what the title of this um, VR, is, like this tag is. Mine is a VR to Heather Carter. I will link her video down below where she links where it originated from. And, um, and I'll also, you know, copy and paste the questions below if you want to participate. I'd love to leave a comment in the box uh, below, in the comment box below, so that I know that you uh, did do this um, video. And I'd like to come over and watch it. Thank you and have a beautiful day. Bye bye.